Hello, everyone, and welcome to Call Your Hits, a Storm Riders Airsoft podcast. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Today, Pat and I are going to be talking through some teching checklists um, um, that we like to go through whenever we're having an issue with one of our with one of our airsoft guns. And this is coming out of a game that I played over the weekend, where, you know, I was playing I was playing a game and my gun was not really doing what I thought it should be doing at the time. And so I want to give a sort of a look behind the curtain, like how exactly would I troubleshoot that? How exactly did I troubleshoot that? And sort of what are those common steps that we tend to follow before we so, uh, sort of just jump into, okay, we need to tear this apart and figure out what's in, going on inside. A short lesson in the uh, gun teching process without cracking your gear, gearbox open and without throwing your gun on the ground. <laughs> yeah, totally. So uh, the the game that we were playing, I mean, we had a pretty good day, a pretty good skirmish over the weekend. We had a really good turnout for, again, for our local scene. We had well over 20 bodies. Uh, four of the Storm Riders were out. We played some really tremendous games. Actually, we played a defense game that... It was like six of us on like, I don't know, like 18 or 15 people or something like that. And we absolutely destroyed. Like it was just, we had limited lives and the attackers had unlimited lives over 15 minutes and none of us went through all of our lives. We just, we held the position for the entire game. It was... Feels uh, good. It was a sight, <laughs> yeah, it was, it, it felt good. And I think uh, just, and I know that's not really the topic of this episode, but it was interesting from the standpoint of being in a position where we were utilizing cover really well and we were watching the other team and they were they were definitely not doing that and we were able to take advantage of that every single time uh and then you layer on the fact that we were very well coordinated and the other team was not coordinating as well and so what ends up happening is you know it should be you know 16 on 6 or 18 on 6 whatever the numbers are but it never actually ends up like that it always ends up on like 3 on 2 Right, they're attacking one side, and it's three guys attacking you. So it's not six on on two or eight on two. It's just three people, and you shoot them, and then they go back to spawn, and so on and so forth. So, anyways, that was a really that was a really interesting game. But I bring that up because my gun was performing. I'm gonna say admirably in that game. Like I was doing work. <laughs> pull trigger, hit target. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, and you know me. Like I was pull trigger multiple times, but hit the target. Um, I mean, you do hate ammo. It's fun. <laughs> well, I was shooting people like far side of the uh, of the field. They were trying to move around, and I could see them. Like they would try to like go further back and then try and move around. But when they were going further back to where they thought they were safe, so to speak, and then they would just sort of walk out of cover, and I would just shoot them and hit them, and then they would be like, you could see their arms drop, like oh god, I mean, and they would a, walk back to the spawn. <laughs> yeah, right. Assuming that you can walk out of cover safely is a questionable choice. Well, yeah, and I mean, you know, sometimes you think you're far enough and, and so on. But anyways, my gun was doing great that game. And then we had a couple of games in between, and then we moved on to the D-Day field. And the D-Day field, I mean, we call it that because it's it's a large flat piece of, of land um, where at one end there's on a bit of a hill two bunkers and like sandbags that are set up. And then the whole approach is basically just trenches. And at the far end of the field, there's a wooded area with like old like landing craft. So basically just wooden boxes where the attackers start. And their whole objective is to get to the bunkers. It's a long, terrible walk. <laughs> yeah, they don't have to get over them. They don't have to like kill all the defenders. All they need to do is actually just physically get to the bunkers and like basically tag them. And then they would, they win. And during that game, I was on the defensive team. And I decided that, you know what, like, I'm going to make good use of my camo by pulling myself back into the woods a little bit, taking one of the flank sides where I had an okay view of one side of the field and just use my camouflage to conceal myself and engage from there rather than trying to be a bit further up, like on or in the bunkers uh, shooting at people, which is usually like a death trap anyway, right? <laughs> yes, <laughs> in a word. And so I'm in this position and I can see pretty well. I can see enemy players. And there's a lot of brush, so uh, I have to shoot a lot to get through the brush. And eventually I, I clear it off brush that my, my shots are going through pretty clear. And I'm Step shooting one, at shoot them. Shoot a hole in the cover. 
Well, and I mean, you may have experienced that before. It's something that, that does happen. Like if there's a little bit of cover in front of you or like concealment from shrub, like eventually you need to shoot some holes through it with your BB so you get a, you get a clear oh, yeah, it's, field. It's right? 100% a part of playing yeah. in any anywhere that's got a lot of coniferous forest. Yeah. So I'm shooting, make myself a little uh, hole so I can start shooting through. Uh, not that there's not other fire lanes, but like that's that was the most advantage one for me. So I'm just shooting through this hole. And I can observe, right? So I can see what's going on in this portion of the field. I can talk to John, who's you know to my immediate right, and pass information on to him. Or he can pass information on to me. Um, and I'm shooting. And I can see the enemies at the other side of the field. And in my mind, I'm like, all right, I'm going to shoot at those guys who are so far back. Because I'll be able to hit them. And I'll be able to sort of keep them there and keep them from advancing. And so I'm shooting there. And I mean, I'm not expecting to be tremendously effective. Like, I'm not expecting to tag them out, although that would be nice. But I'm thinking, you know what? I'm putting my BBs that far down the field. At least they're going to be keeping their heads down, right? At least they're not going to be advancing on the field. And so I'm shooting, I'm shooting, I'm shooting. And then after a while, like, I'm not hitting any of them. And I'm like, that kind of sucks. Like, that should not be the case, right? And it's a very irritating feeling right like you know you've got an upgraded gun you know you've got a lot of you know sort of accuracy dialed in and you're not getting anywhere with it totally and in my mind these guys are like 180 to 200 feet like somewhere like i don't know 50 meters maybe something like that which is and sort of well within the effective range of totally totally and this sort of is validated because i can see bbs coming in towards me now the bbs aren't particularly effective um, I know that, you know, I'm pretty far away. They're pretty far away too. And so they're hitting the cover, uh, you know, around me and they're just basically bouncing off. So they're not even making it through the foliage, right? Which is a pretty clear indicator that there's not a lot of energy left in that BB. If it's not making it into the branch, they're shooting you from pretty far away too. But the totally. BBs are hitting the branches and I'm like, well, if they're hitting the branches and they're not hitting me, there's no way I can't be hitting these guys. Right. So I'm shooting, I'm shooting, I'm shooting and nothing's happening. Now, at the same time, like other players are advancing and boy, howdy, when they're getting closer, I'm hitting those guys. No problem. Right. Like once they get to like the first trench or the second trench or whatever, or they're trying to rush up to the building. This um, game's easy. <laughs> yeah. Like, I mean, we were, uh, we were blasting them and I mean, you know, they, they had again, unlimited respawns, just time to try and get across the field basically. Um, which as a side note, I always find it strange when you give, um, unlimited respawns and people sort of hold back. Cause like, I get that you don't want to, you know, get hit or whatever, which is fine, but like, you should really be taking the area 51 approach, right? Like they can't shoot all of us. Have you considered shouting really loudly and rushing yeah. forward while firing? <laughs> I, I have a I have a strategy that I want to try next time we play on that field, but that's a conversation for another day. So, anyways, I'm shooting, I'm shooting, I'm shooting, and I'm there's a guy in the sniper tower, and I'm not I'm not hitting him, and I'm so I'm getting pretty frustrated. My gun is getting hot because I'm putting a lot of fire down, right? I mean, we're talking like I don't know six mags, eight mags, like start, stop, start, stop all the time, constantly, which does make your motor heat up. And I wasn't the only one either. Like John's gun was a thousand getting hot. Rounds Stephens, ammunition later. <laughs> yeah, definitely, right? So obviously it, it, it's getting it's getting hot. Anyways. Not the point of the story. I'm shooting, you know, the we wind the clock down, we eventually win. They didn't get close. That's that's it. We're going to begin wrote, wrapping right? Phil's hand grip in tactical bacon. <laughs> well, and, and, you know, my gun did get hot, and I, I've been concerned about that in the past. That's part of why I got a teenly motor, because I wanted something that was... Um, robust. Just <laughs> w robust, but also better, you know? But yeah, the reality is, like, even Stefan's gun is AEG. It was getting hot, right? And even uh, John's gun was getting hot too. So, I mean, it's the start-stop action, right? Like when you're shooting semi all the time and you're going like crack, 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 all the time like that, like your motor is going to get hot, right? Yeah, it's um, working very hard and that's how it vents waste energy. Like, <laughs> Yeah, like it might be even better if you're shooting, you know, full, but of course that's not really interesting to me. So anyways, point is um, we're shooting a whole lot and we win the game. Um, and then we walk off the field and I'm like, I'm, I'm glad that we won. Like, I think we did, the team did really well, really happy with how we performed, etc. But I'm in the back of my mind. I'm like, this gun is not doing the thing that it's supposed to do, right? Pat and I built this gun to be shooting longer ranges than I was shooting before. This with field is well, well, with lots of accuracy, which it does have, but this field is well within the range, um, the effective range of my rifle, right? And... At the end of the day, I'm like, okay, there's got to be something wrong here. Like, there's got to be something wrong with my air seal. Uh, there's got to be something wrong with my barrel. Maybe I haven't cleaned it enough. 
um, which, you know, all of these things are, are running through my mind and are totally possible. So I'm not like, I'm not angry or upset about it by any stretch of the imagination. Like I'm not going back to the huddle, uh, to, excuse me, I'm not going back to the, the safe zone being like, oh man, this sucks. I'm going home. Like, obviously not. I'm just sort of like, huh, this is not really doing the thing. Uh, I got to figure out what uh, what's going to go later. I mean, you know, so, why is this underperforming is a reasonable question to ask if your gun is underperforming. Yeah. And so the first thing that I did when I got back to the safe zone, uh, I the one of the people that I bumped into uh, was Rourke. Rourke is one of the local players. And he was in the sniper tower and I was shooting at him. Right. And I know for a fact that it was him. And I know for a fact that he knew it was me shooting at him. And uh, obviously I knew it was him. So I, asked, I said to him like, hey, I was shooting at you in the sniper tower, right? He's like, yep. And I was like, so can you remember what my BBs were doing when they were getting to you? And he was like, they were getting kind of close, but then they were basically just going from flight pretty slow and then just dropping basically straight down. And I'm like, okay. So what that meant to me was that my BBs had really run out of energy, right? That's they're at their maximum, maximum range. Yep. Just and going as far down. as that system can drive them. Yeah, exactly. So I'm like, that's weird. Because from where I was to the sniper tower is only like, I don't know, like 200 feet maximum. Right? So I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. So then that's the point where I started thinking, okay, there's got to be something wrong with, with my rifle. There's, you know, maybe, you know, it's not something critically wrong because it's still shooting. But I, I've got to investigate a little bit more. So I want to pause here because I think it's important to, to think about like what my thought process is at this point. So obviously what I'm thinking of is I'm looking at the performance of my gun in the context of what it just did. And I have certain expectation. My expectation was my gun should be shooting further than that. It should have more effective range than that. And there, there isn't right. It's that's not what's happening. The challenge is it turns out I was wrong, right? So when you actually look at the distance from where I was to where this guy was when I was shooting at him. So Phil was thinking it was like, what, 180? 180 to 200. And it's much closer to 225. And that's on the flat. Let's not remember that I was lower than he was. He was elevated. So if you know you know the Pythagorean theorem or the 3, 4, 5 rule or whatever you want to call it, that hypotenuse is a longer right? It's longer than 225. If you haven't learned to hate Pythagoras yet. <laughs> yeah. So really this guy is, you know, I don't know what the math on it is. I don't know how elevated what he was, but you're looking at 225 feet at least, right? So that's well over 60 meters, right? And I'm here thinking it's like 50, right? And that's significant, right? <laughs> well, it's, it's a big difference. And what my airsoft gun is doing is actually pretty well within tolerances when you think about it, right? Like, it's an M110 spring that I have in there, shooting like 1.4 joules or something like that. Yeah, trying to keep right? things well within, like comfortably within the field limits. Totally. Well, not well within, but you know. Well, I mean, the field limit is 1.6 and 1.4 is, you know, is substantially lower compared to where I was doing before at like 1.58 or whatever. We're like really <laughs> skirting that line, right? <laughs> Sitting on it going, hmm, we cannot use lighter ammo <laughs> or heavier ammo. We must stay exactly where we are. Yeah, exactly. So I'm looking at this and I'm like, oh, well, it's not performing the way that I want it to. And it turns out that, well, like I like I just explained, it probably was. It's my expectation and my estimation of the distances that I was engaging at were not, were not correct. And, you know, you mentioned to me um, that you'd sort of been thinking also like, well, he can reach me. Well... <clears throat> the um, extra 10 feet of elevation he has is a big help to getting further out towards you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. The other thing is, yeah, he, he was certainly shooting at me, but there were other people too. And I, you know, once they're in flight, like I can't really tell the difference between his BBs and anybody else's BBs, <laughs> right? So He's how do I know? conveniently colored tracers? <laughs> yeah, no. Actually, it's funny. I was talking to Rourke about that after. I was like, I should have been using black BBs, but that's beside the point. Um, you know, like all this is happening and you're in the, in the heat of the moment, you're sort of like, okay, well, this is what's happening, but it turns out that you don't really have the perfect situational awareness, right? So he's further away than I am and uh, he's further away than I think I should say, and I'm not able to reach him. So now the question that, you know, when Pat and I were talking about this earlier, like, okay, so what do we need to do here? 
do I need more range on my gun? I mean, there's like, you know, <laughs> technologically speaking, we can put an M120 back in and it'll can yeah. go back right back to skirting that limit. And, you know, depending on how the mm, not amazing chronos that we're using to check are and the weight of your BB and the, I don't know, relative temperature outside are, you'll be mm, maybe not able to use the gun some of the time. Yeah, and, and that's that's definitely a reality that existed before. Like I would, I you know, I'd get to the field in the morning and be like, oh, I wonder if I'll pass Chrono this morning. And now I never have to worry about that. Yeah, and you know, we um, swapped a bunch of our springs down because I guess essentially <laughs> the air seals were mm, too good. Uh, mm -hmm. Is that a problem you can have? So, you know, we'd rather not play that game. And like I'm run my HPA at like one point five ish. Um, because I mean, one point six is yeah, it's the field legal limit, but like I don't really need that much oomph most of the time. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so like we can take Phil's, I mean, we can take Phil's gun up above that and semi lock it, and then it's a DMR, and that's technically completely fine within the field rules, and uh, you know, it's a practical build option. <laughs> do you want us to do that? <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, it's worth thinking about because like, so what is actually the problem? Well, the problem is I'm in a defensive position on the D-Day field and I'm further back from the, 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 the front line that we can occupy and I can't hit other players at the other extreme end of the field on the top of a two-story structure. And when I think about that, like, well, obviously we, like Pat said, we could put an M1, M120 spring in there and we could DMR and semi-lock it, make my, turn my rifle into a DMR. Yeah, we can build you a Springer, a, a Springer bolt action. Yeah. Like the way we have solutions that can get us that range if that's the actual objective. <laughs> yeah. And as you think about it, you know, and as I thought about it too, it's like, what, like that's one situation, right? That is the only situation really where when we're playing at frontline, we have a firing lane that is... 225 <laughs> plus feet right you know, and like i think the absolute longest range that you could possibly engage someone would be like from the top of the two-story structure to the back corner of the d-day field which would probably be you know upwards of 110 meters like 300 and you know 30 feet or something like that um but like who is being effective at that range anyway? But not uh, not you, the person who's doing the shooting at them, and definitely not the other person. It's like they're a rental or what have you. So you now have this gun, which has been upgraded to shoot, you know, potentially over field limits or for DMR, locked, semi-locked as a DMR, which, and you, you know, we can certainly agree, like, semi-locking is not a tremendous pain point for me in particular, right? I mean, we've got... Firstly, you know, you tend to use semi, and secondly, we've got Spectre Fets in them, so it's just, you know, like, open your phone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, like, what are we actually solving? Because 99% of the time, like, when if I think back to the weekend, that is the only time that I was shooting at someone, and I couldn't reach them. And, like, right? the... So there are two things there, right? So the first question is, so if he was putting fire on you not terribly effectively, and you were putting fire on him not terribly effectively... Um, I would argue that perhaps, um, not in the heat of the moment, but in retrospect, the correct play is for one of you or both of you to rearrange where you are, right? A hundred percent. And I mean, to be honest, when you think about the D-Day game, they can't win if they just stay back there. Their objective is to get up to me. <clears throat> yeah, so <laughs> realistically, like it's not my job in this situation, it's not my job to move. It's definitely going to be his because if he wants to stay back there all day, then he can, he can do that. He's not going to win. And if he's shooting ineffectively at you while he's doing that, then so much the better, right? He's not putting effective rounds on one of your teammates. So mm, that's 10 out yeah, of 10, very right? true as well. Yeah. But, you know, we know, uh, and I mean, we've talked about sort of, you know, your play style and the fact that our play styles collectively evolve over time uh, as a team. But like, do you want the, uh, the baggage that comes with having that being a semi-locked DMR? Um, you know, off the top of my head, uh, it pretty much eliminates uh, the uh, sort of urban area of the field from play because you'll have a 50 foot MED and it's like 80 feet across. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And even if you think about having that on the D Day field, well, that's fine for shooting at people who are across the field, but once they start moving up and they get to like the middle trench or whatever, they're getting close to that 50-foot mark, and then once they get to the front trench, you just can't shoot at them, period. 
right? Yeah, you're going to have to start. Because they're like 15 feet away or whatever. Yeah, you're going to have to start thinking about that. You're going to start thinking about, you know, yeah. positional stuff. And like, it was easier as a team when we had like eight or 12 guys on the field to have a couple of people rocking a really long ranged rifle and um, playing around those rules, but also supporting the rest of the team by, while doing so. You know, at this point, you know, I mean, I, my, uh, my HPA gun is semi-locked. I could, to you know, uh, tune it all the way up to the DMR field limits. I just don't find it practical for any of the stuff we're doing. <laughs> yeah. So when you're thinking about, you know, your airsoft upgrades, which is where ultimately this conversation is sort of headed, is you really need to think about what is actually practical and useful for you in the situations that you play. And the reality for us is that most of the games that we play, we are shooting at targets that are within 200 feet, like 99% of the time. Absolutely. And I would say 80% of the time within 150 feet. So, so if I can shoot at someone at 150 feet away and not have a hold, right? That's perfect. That's all you really need for our particular purposes. And, you know, I'd also point out that... Um, and we kind of, uh, we've mentioned this sort of idea before, I think, but specialist tools for airsoft are probably not the thing you want for your primary basic piece of kit, right? Yeah. So whatever your primary rifle is for airsoft, unless you are so in love with the LMG or the bolt action that you just, it's all you want to ever play, you probably want something that can do as many things as possible, which means some yeah. sort of carbine or rifle length airsoft gun um running a setup that allows you to you know reach out as far as is reasonable for it but without you know just making the fps completely insane <laughs> you know because we're using pretty much everything in phil's gun uh that we can possibly use to get extra distance out of it you know we we have a really good r hop in it uh we have a type 4 barrel in it we've got extremely good consistent air seal but it's just, you know, there's a point where you're like, well, it goes flat for as far as we can possibly make it go flat, and then it falls out of the sky. Physics. Yeah. <laughs> Physics, exactly. Um, so it's a, and I think it's interesting because that's ultimately where uh, where I sort of wanted to have this conversation. It's like, so let's, so you, the listener, are now aware that I was wrong about the distance that I was shooting at, which is a very important realization. But I didn't realize that until, you know, I got home and I checked Google Maps and I, you know, I made a measurement and, and all this and went, kind of stuff, huh. right? <laughs> yeah. But what was my thought process going up to that? Well, I need to think about, okay, well, what is actually going wrong with my gun? So logically speaking, I'm thinking, okay, well, I'm not getting the kind of range that I'm supposed to be getting. And the only reason why that would not happen is because I don't have the same amount of kinetic energy coming uh, out with the BB, yeah. right? So spring issue, air seal issue. Yeah, or there's some sort of obstruction that is slowing it down in the barrel. But I would also have experienced accuracy issues and like stuff like that if that and, had been the case. I mean, right? that'll pretty much jam your gun if that's happening anyway. Like, Yeah, very. Yeah, and it was definitely not jammed because I put a lot of BBs in there, <laughs> right? We stress tested that problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's like, is this a gem? I don't know. I just put 300 rounds through it. Okay, well, probably not a gem then. Um, but yeah, so so seriously, I think that's where I'm sort of left. And so I start thinking about, okay, well, what would have happened in between then and now, like then being the last time I worked on my gun and now that might cause an air seal issue? Well, really, when I started to start thinking about it, I'm like, well, it's been a really long time since I actually cracked that gun open. In fact, I don't think we cracked it open since we built it. Yeah, the last mistaken. time we cracked it open was almost certainly early last year. Yeah. Like around this right? time last year. Yeah. So uh, probably a little bit later, I think, actually, because we had, mm. uh, we put in the longer barrel and stuff yeah, like that later many, on. Yeah, <laughs> many, many Yeah, but I mean, still, it's not, I mean, we're talking July, like it probably the difference between July and like September or something like that. Regardless, it's been a while. It's been at least six months. I haven't opened it up, right? So what can happen to your gearbox in that amount of time that could cause pressure loss? 
so or compression loss i should say you know i mean on the whole you're gonna have just the silicone oil that you're using to lube your air seal parts is going to be mm. gone <laughs> mm -hmm. or mostly yep. gone um you know so when you check that out you're going to have definitely limited uh lubrication on those seals which is not an enormous problem um if everything is working fine uh but you know uh, it's certainly a thing that's worth checking, especially if you're, you know, at the point of being able to take down and put back together your airsoft gun, whatever it may be, um, you know, as a maintenance thing in an hour or two, uh, or less if you, better, you know, great. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it's, it's worth checking. Um, you know, I, I have to admit I'm not as good at preventative maintenance with uh, AEGs as I should be in terms of like, yeah, it's probably worth just taking apart, lubing it, putting it back together once a season um, just to check on everything. Um, my own tendency is more to go, oh, I see a performance dip. All right, now we need to go tinker with stuff. Um, but I think that's probably not actually the best approach, <laughs> if I'm being honest. Yeah. Like, it's definitely a, a do what I say, not what I do, because I would also agree, like, I know about preventative maintenance. Have I done any of it on my AG since since we last spoke about, uh, since we last worked on it, I should say? Obviously not, since this is where we are now. But notice a performance dip, and then you're like, oh, well, now this is what I need to do. Even though, as we just discussed, it actually isn't a performance dip, but I didn't know that at the time. Yeah, and, you know, one of the one of the things that resulted from that was a conversation where, you know, Phil went, hey, Pat, we should take my gun apart and just re -loop it and put it back together. And I was like, yeah, it's probably a good idea. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, if it had not come up, would we have thought of that? Probably not. Uh, is that less than ideal? Probably, you know, it's, it's not the most sensible <laughs> thing we've done. Let's put it that way. But, you know, it does, um, <laughs> wrong conclusion, uh, initially right result. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think, Airsofters in general, unless you're, you know, like a, a bit of a weirdo like Chaz who likes to work on a million guns at any given time. I uh, love you, buddy. You know, I think we have a tendency to be like, it's not broke, don't fix it. Right? And I've even heard Jason Fong say that before, where he's like, my goal is to build this, put it together, and have it perform perfectly, and then don't touch it. And I think there's a lot of value to that approach if you are either really, really busy or don't have the skill set to do the maintenance yourself, right? If you were looking at paying me, you know, $100 or $200 to do that, it might be a different conversation in terms of like, is that a useful way to spend your money? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, the fact that you can pay me in, you know, hanging out with you is definitely a benefit. Um, and the fact that you can do a lot of the work yourself you know like really you need me to provide materials because <laughs> i have them why yeah not, right yeah that's a better situation than some people find themselves in but you know there's also not a whole lot going on in this context we're not reshimming it we're not rebuilding anything we're just taking it apart and going all right have a look at the o-rings they're all good we know they're all good because you were firing at someone 200 feet away and getting shots that came close to them like <laughs> cool mm -hmm. <laughs> you know um, do anything we need to do, probably nothing, re -lube it, put it back together. Great. Done. Um, go re-zero it because we've taken it apart and put it back together and it's good practice. Um, that's not terrible, right? That is really limited effort for us. Um, and you know, it's one of those things where in the, <laughs> in the long to medium term, you know, I, I tend to think every year that we should probably be cracking a bunch of our guns and doing this. Um, you know, I literally have both of my AEGs that I currently own uh, that aren't the Garand open. Uh, the Garand is absolutely living in if it ain't broke, don't fix it, Ville, uh, because taking it apart is a nightmare. <laughs> uh, and I, I'll pay the toll for that in the future if I have to. <laughs> yeah, but um, in fairness, you also use it a lot less. Totally. Right? It's, so, it's, it is a gun that I bring out for fun. It's not my primary airsoft rifle at yeah. all. Yeah, you're not putting like you know, 4,000 rounds a month through it or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Right? Like, you know, yeah. the uh, 
the 249, I, I know I cracked it open and lubed it last year. It doesn't need any TLC. Um, it's very robust. Uh, besides which, I intend probably before this fall to put HPA set up in it. So, eh, whatever. Um, my two AEGs have been opened this year, so they're both, you know, check the box, carry on. Um, but, like, John's probably hasn't been opened <laughs> in two years, and we should probably do that. You know, yeah. um, Steph can do his own maintenance. So like if he wants to hang out while he does it, sure, no problem, you know, but there are definitely folks on our team who like, we should be doing that probably yearly. Um, and like in terms of the uh, silicone based lubricants on the air seals, it's not really a uh, number of rounds put through it kind of thing so much as it is a time usage thing. Like you're not mm -hmm. shooting a ton of silicone out of your gun. <laughs> if you are, you shouldn't be. Yeah. Well, if yeah. You, if you are, there's something you've you've put too much in, or there's something else gone weirdly wrong. Um, yeah. And you'll notice because your BBs won't go through the hop up; like they'll just fall out <laughs> because mm -hmm. it, they're lubricated and the hop up works based on friction. <laughs> Oops. You know. But yeah, it's it's probably worthwhile doing that preventative maintenance. I mean. I'm, I'm willing to say actually that it's definitely worthwhile and that we're just daft. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I would agree. And I think when you start to see that performance dip, like that's like you were saying earlier, that's a point where you should recognize and go, Oh, okay, well maybe it's time. And in my case, there was no real performance decrease as it turns out, but even just the perception of it should be the, the prompt in your brain that goes, okay, let's go through that checklist of like, is anything broken? Like, is it, is it functioning like within the, expected way so obviously like if your if your bbs are falling off before you think they should that's certainly an an issue but obviously if your bbs are just rolling out of the barrel like that's a problem i would say yeah totally right so you start to go through that list and in my case in this particular instance like it was a really a no biggie but i've had it much more complicated than that and so have you and hitting that point where you're like oh hey i should probably just go in and make sure everything is right and tight thought is useful you know um mm -hmm. because it's like yeah okay so um you know is the motor making any kind of strange noise no sounds normal good um you know is the motor heating up way more than it should be well it was heating up but we were firing an enormous amount of semi-automatic shots so in a really short period of time so probably fine you know um rounds are still coming out of the barrel we've tested that cool at that point, it's like, all right, so it's probably, you know, if there is an issue, um, relatively mild, right? If if <laughs> if it starts making weird noises, stop shooting immediately. Um, yeah, definitely. You know, we've got a little bit of extra protection there because, like, if the motor starts doing weird stuff, the FET will stop firing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but ultimately, yeah, you're going, okay, well, I have this set of circumstances, they're causing me to be concerned. Yeah, okay. Um, talk to your gun tech if you know one. Uh, frankly, pop online and message me if you don't. Um, I'll help if I can. And you'd be surprised at how effectively I can diagnose issues just by hearing the weird noise the gun is making. Um, strange skills you pick up. But uh, yeah, just preventative maintenance is a solid idea here. And it's like, okay, well, if if, for argument's sake, Phil had had a performance dip there and was only getting 150 feet uh, instead of the sort of 200 that's our goal for that rifle, um, the answer, if all of the other things he said are true, are take it down, check the bucking, check the hop patch. If those are both fine, we know it's not an issue with that chunk of the gun. Um, we've resolved the hop-up issues, <laughs> hopefully permanently knock on wood mm -hmm. um but all of that being the case okay we're good then it's like all right well if we're getting a pressure loss somewhere and it's not those uh it's probably the air seal parts go in see if we've torn a uh, o-ring see if we need to replace an o-ring which happens you know they're uh, a little piece of rubber that's disposable there's nothing in there that they should catch on um we haven't got this thing built with an enormously powerful spring that's going to cause problems, but check it. And the answer is probably going to be relube it, <laughs> you know? So at this point, we're going to do that either way because yeah, sure. It's shooting fine, but we know it hasn't been lubed up in around 12 months. 
we know it's had a bunch of rounds put through it in that period of time. We know Phil wants to sort of, you know, um, take an hour at some point in the next week or two, um, sort of get it as dialed in as he can possibly get it for the rest of the season and leave it there. So easy choice. Yeah. And, it, you know, to, to, to close it all up, I mean, I, I did also have a, a pet theory that uh, it was actually you coming in and sabotaging my gun little by little to force me to get on the HPA. I, um, I've actually been but, paying the chickens to do it. <laughs> ah, yes, that's right. They are uh, my mercenaries. But, 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 but seriously, though, I think to, to, to close this all out, like... It's fine to have a process when you're when you're going to be looking at your at your uh, upgrades or you know maintenance on your gun. Absolutely important. But one of the key things I think in our conversation, which is always really important, is to think about what exactly is your objective, right? We talked about this at the start, and I, I really want to reiterate: you need to think about what are you really trying to do with this gun, and what exactly are you going to be using it for like 90% of the time? And so if you're in a situation, and I think Pat, you said, you said it best, like if you're in a situation where you can't hit the person at this long range, why don't you just move, right? And it's, of course, in the situation that I'm in as a defender, like I'm not the one who's going to be moving and that, that's fine and dandy. But I could easily just, just as easily be on the other side to like next week or whenever when I'm attacking and I know that it does me no good to get up on top of that sniper tower and start trying to shoot at the other at the other uh, opponents on the end of the field because I'm probably not going to be very effective because I don't really have the range. Like, I might get an extra, you know, 10 feet or whatever once we relube it and et cetera. But, like, I know that that's not really effective. And also, I know that I can't win the game staying back there. So, really, I need to think about, okay, do I really need to build a gun that will allow me to do this one thing really, really well at the detriment, especially on the fields that we play on, at the detriment of being able to do everything else, right? I mean, I think and that as an airsoft player in general, it's good practice to try to train yourself. And honestly, this is something that comes out of uh, out of Warhammer um, for me, but like almost certainly other places for other people. If you're looking at the situation on the field and you've had time to stop and think wherever you are, Right, so you're not mid push. You're not just like running and gunning. Um, it's useful to go. Am I effective? I, am I accomplishing the objective? Is what I'm yeah. doing pushing us towards actually winning? <laughs> and if your answer is, I don't know, or no, move. <laughs> yeah, and it's very easy to lie to yourself. And I think we've illustrated that perfectly. I've been playing airsoft for like 16 years. I've been playing, you know, shooting sports for longer than that. Um, I misjudged a distance. I thought someone was, you know, 180, 200 feet, and it turns out they were further away than that. And I'd argue... If that can happen to me, that can certainly happen to any of y'all who are listening. I mean, I'd argue that it right? happens all the time in Airsoft, right? Like, if you go to yeah. YouTube right now, like, pause this podcast and go to YouTube and just toss in, like, you know, uh, Airsoft not calling hits, and you look at the first five videos that pop up, three of them, four of them, five of them are going to be people shooting at long range going, well, that should be hitting. They don't know. Like, they're not carrying around a laser range finder on their gun. Totally. Um, and they're just going, yeah, no, it should be hitting them. And I mean, I've been in exactly the situation Phil's talking about here on exactly the field, because I play here, <laughs> where it's like, okay, I'm putting rounds down range. Um, on the D-Day field and I'm not hitting people at the other end of it, at the far end of it and thinking, man, like my rifle is really good for range. Why am I not landing these hits? And uh, I've done that with like, you know, a red dot. And I've also done it with a magnified optic. And with a magnified optic, I go, oh, I'm dropping off like 15 feet yeah. before them. Good enough. I mean, if you go to like the Airsoft subreddit, you will have people hand over fist telling you they have AEGs that are shooting 300 feet, two, two inch groupings at 300 feet. Sure. And they'll swear it up and down that that's what they're, and it's just like, guys, you don't know what 300 <laughs> feet looks like. I'm sorry. You just do not. I mean. Right. And they'll say, no, I absolutely do. And it's like, you, there's not a chance. There's not a chance that these people are rocking an AEG that is within field limits. So let's say within, you know, 1.6 joules, even 1.8 joules that are shooting like two inch groupings at 300 feet. It's just not happening, <laughs> right? You know, I mean, if they are, they're, uh, I'm not sure they're using an airsoft gun. Um, 
<laughs> you know, but like the, the practicality of it is just that, right. You know, one of our, uh, one of our friends, uh, bought a uh, laser rangefinder module that like clips into works with his um, his iPhone like five or six years ago and I remember he just let me play with it and I was like man do I not have any idea what distances are you know yeah. like I've done uh, sword fighting based martial arts for a really long time so like yeah I have a pretty solid idea of what like five and eight feet look like <laughs> um, yeah. I've put a lot of practice into having that you know uh, I consider of judge room size and like, oh, how many pats long is this? <laughs> mm -hmm. But, you know, I'm sitting in a room that I spend a ton of time in. You know, it's, it is where my painting setup is. It's where I do some of my gun teching. It's where my computer is. I have no really accurate idea of the dimensions of this room. I would have to measure it in order to give you something that I thought was within like five feet on each side. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and like, I think that sort of illustrates uh, what we were saying at the start, which is that, you know, you may think that you're, you're doing X or, or what you're at, you know, Y range or whatever. But the reality is like, if you stop and you you're honest with yourself and you're like, do I actually know whether or not I'm in range or not? And if the answer is, well, I'm not a hundred percent, then you should be doing something else, right? If 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 it, that's possible. And my, like I said, in my case, it, it really wasn't. But I also didn't need to be as far back. Like I could have moved up an extra, you know, 10 feet or whatever. Would that have helped in this particular situation? Probably not, but that's, you know, beside the point. I also want to point out, because I think it's really um, relevant and I think it was really clever of Phil, that going to the guy who he knows on the other side and going, hey, what was the behavior of my rounds as they came towards you roughly? is a really sensible solution to this in terms of getting useful, viable information. Because, you know, um, if you just come to me and gone, hey, I'm not getting range, like, you know, I think it's dropping 50 feet further, 50 feet closer to me than it should, my answer would still have been, okay, I guess we'll take it apart and check all of these things. Mm -hmm. But because he went and said, hey, what were they doing? I had a ton more information and he had a ton more information, which allowed Phil to literally go on Google Maps, check that distance and go, oh, no, I just misestimated. Yeah. Which is fantastic. And like, so for Phil, I mean, all of that happening is great because it means that we have a better idea of what we need to do. In this case, not a whole lot with his gun. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, in terms of, you know, the, the average listener who doesn't have a gun tack on call and or who doesn't know how to gun tack themselves, that just saved you $400. <laughs> or $200, right? That saved you uh, the amount of time it would have taken the gun tech to diagnose whatever's wrong with the gun. In this case, nothing. But they, I, you know, if you're asking me to do that, I still have to check basically everything. If you go, my gun's not working right and I have no idea why. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's like, all right, cool. I mean, triage, but like, I'm still going to have to take apart the entire hop-up assembly, the entire air seal parts, check the gears, check all the stuff. I don't need to do that. Phil doesn't need to do that. That's huge. For you, that's, cash put back in your pocket that you can spend on other airsoft related things or not as you choose but like at least you're not wasting it yeah that's a great point so uh, at the end of the day like like we said when you're having these sort of issues you, you really need to think about what your expectations are and we've talked about expectations before on the podcast but you need to think about what what you're trying to achieve at the end of the day and whether or not you're actually achieving that and uh trying to get confirmation um of what was occurring it is very helpful, especially if you play like like we do at like longer ranges, outdoors, etc. Being able to talk to someone, and then once you have a sense of that, then you really need to think about okay, is it a me problem? Is it a gun problem? Is it a combination of the two? Uh, and then you can come up with a plan of action. And like Pat said, like if you have more information up front, that will save you a lot of time and or money, um, and that's never going to be a bad thing. Yeah, right. And you know. Um, <laughs> as often ends up being sort of one of the, the final points for me when we're talking about tech stuff, you know, don't overthink it is, is still great advice, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so Phil has had a lot of practice at diagnosing these, uh, and trying to figure out, you know, what may or may not be wrong with them. <laughs> um, and, uh, has reached the point where his triage is the same as mine is okay. Well, I know it's not doing any of these stupid things, so it's probably not any of these problems. Um, you know, a lot of that is broadly applicable. If the motor or gears are making a strange noise, stop shooting because you have a real immediate problem that will cost you money if you keep pulling the trigger. 
uh, and your gun needs to be taken down, period. You know, if you see a really, you know, large drop off of range, yeah, check your hop up and hop up parts first, right? Um, especially if you shoot a lot, um, and especially if your gun is, you know, uh, in any way more on the high powered end, um, and God help us doubly, especially if you're using cheap shitty BBs, uh, you know, tears happen in the, uh, in the hop up bucking. That is probably your first port of call if something's gone wrong with your ear seal, right? Um, it's relatively unlikely that your spring has failed. <laughs> it happens. Um, but like not often. <laughs> yeah. So guys, hopefully you found sort of our thought process around that helpful. It's certainly something to to keep in mind to, you know, keep your keep your particular thought process uh, in sort of a linear progression of like Pat was just explaining sort of of things that can go wrong. Hopefully we're helping you be jump sensible. Ahead. <laughs> Yeah, and not jump ahead to being like, oh, well, my spring must have died when there's other things that are probably more likely um, that you should be checking first. So hopefully that gives you a bit of a sense of how we do that and how we also spot our problems on the field as we're, you know, what we're looking for when we're using our airsoft guns. And, um, you know, realistically also kind of why we have backup gear, right? Yeah. You know, uh, because it turns out in this case that there was nothing wrong with that. And I, you know, I would have been fairly surprised if there was anything wrong with that gun. You know, we built it really well. Um, it, it shouldn't be having any issues, but as we, you know, keep talking about, these are toys. Um, you can build them as well as you like, and they're still not exactly an optimal piece of machinery. <laughs> yeah, totally. So guys, thanks so much for listening. That's really all we have for you this week. Uh, if you do want to keep the conversation going, as we always say, we do have our Discord. The link is in the description below. Uh, it's a great international community, Airsoft from all around the world. We'd love to have you join. Uh, but until then, that's all we've got for you, and we will talk to you next week. Yeah, absolutely, guys. Um, especially, you know, I'm here if you guys have questions about uh, teching. Um, I hesitate to volunteer Chaz, but, like, he's super on the ball replying in our uh, Discord as well. Uh, and uh, it's summer, so aside from my bizarre sleeping patterns, I'm at your disposal. <laughs> Have a good week, everybody. Take care.